Hello, I'm Dr. Fiona Tuhewe, and welcome to the WHO Africa Media Briefing, taking place in collaboration with APO Group. We begin with some housekeeping. You can choose the language in which you'd like to hear the press conference by turning to the globe at the bottom right and selecting your language. We also have a Q&A uh, option for you to drop your answers in there, your questions in there, and remember that we have an option of you asking your question live. Also, if you want to ask your question live, you will put up your hand and we'll give you an option or, or indicate in the Q&A. So joining us this morning from Brazzaville, Congo, is Dr. Masiri Somoweti, the WHO Regional Director for Africa. And now, Dr. Moweti, I'll let you introduce our other panelists. Good morning and good afternoon. Bonjour, bon dia to all the journalists joining this press conference on the COVID-19 situation in Africa and scaling up the rollout of vaccines. I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Nicholas Crisp, the Deputy Director General of, the National, of National Health Insurance at the Department of Health in South Africa. Welcome, Dr. Crisp, and uh, Dr. Hassan Abdul Nasser, the Director of Immunizations at the Ministry of Public Health, Population and Social Affairs in Niger. Bonjour et bienvenue, Dr. Abdul Nasser. They will both speak about the massive efforts that countries are making to ramp up the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. There have now been almost 8 million cases and 196,000 lives lost to COVID-19 in Africa. Although Africa's third wave peaked in July, the decline in new cases is at a glacial pace, far slower than in previous waves. More than 214,000 new cases were reported in the last week. 24 out of 54 African countries, so nearly half, are still reporting high or fast rising case numbers. The epicenter is a moving target, shifting from one sub-region to the next. Cases are rising in West, Central, and East Africa. In this third wave, every hour, 26 Africans die of COVID-19. The pandemic is still raging and we must not let our guard down. As long as vaccination rates are low, severe illness and deaths risk staying high. Over 143 million vaccine doses have been received in Africa and 39 million people, less than 3% of Africa's population are fully vaccinated. That compares to more than 50% in the European Union and the United States. Equally concerning is a continuing inequity in the distribution of doses. Africa accounts for just 2% over the 5 billion of the over 5 billion doses given globally. This percentage, I'm afraid, hasn't shifted in months. It is encouraging, though, that in the past month, almost 21 million doses have arrived on the continent through COVAX that's equal to the entire four previous months. As WHO, we're working tirelessly to support countries to hit the global target of fully vaccinating 10% of their populations by the end of September. We've just one month to go, and this must, be, and this must concentrate our minds in Africa and minds globally. Already, nine African countries have reached this target, so that's very encouraging. Among those are the island nations such as Seychelles and Cabo Verde, countries that have rolled out vaccines strongly from the start, such as Morocco, and countries where the uptake is rapidly increasing, like South Africa. Many of these countries are in the upper middle or high income brackets and have procured vaccines directly from manufacturers as well as receiving various vaccine supplies. For lower income countries that are relying mainly on donations, the situation is more dire. In current, if the current trends hold, 42 of Africa's 54 countries, nearly 80%, are set to miss the September target, I'm afraid. Three more countries, Equatorial Guinea, Comoros, and Sao Tome and Principe, will meet the target at the current pace. I think a couple of other countries as well, like Senegal, Namibia, and Botswana, if these speed up vaccinations, they too could still reach it. I do commend the commitment of national and local authorities, communities, and partners who are working hard to expand the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines across the continent. 
With concerns about variants and political pressures driving the introduction of booster shots and countries with high vaccination rates expanding their rollouts to reach lower risk groups, our hope for global vaccine equity is once again being challenged. At the same time, African countries must also zero in and drive forward precise plans to rapidly vaccinate the millions of vulnerable people that still face a grave threat. Several countries are moving to vaccinate populations above 18 years and using retired nurses and nursing students, as well as partnering with the private sector to reach targeted populations. Vaccination points are also being expanded for people in hard to reach areas. I encourage more countries to use micro planning to guide vaccinators on where and when to provide vaccination services and to inform communities of how they can access these vaccines. Overall, it's clear that those sharing arrangements need to continue to be stepped up. Longer term, African countries are putting in place systems and hubs to produce vaccines locally, but to fast track the global recovery from this pandemic, international solidarity remains key. We must also remember that at the end, it is people who are going to decide they are going to be vaccinated. So paying attention to informing and um, encouraging the community, supporting them to get vaccinated is also very important. I look forward very much to our conversation today. I welcome our two panelists again, and thank you for having joined us. Thank you, Dr. Moeti. Uh, Dr. Nicholas Crisp, we've heard so much uh, about what South Africa is doing, and from Dr. Moeti's remarks, we hear that South Africa is one of the countries that has hit the 10% mark. Could you tell us how South Africa has managed to ramp up COVID-19 vaccination? Thanks very much. Good day to everybody. And thank you, Dr. Moeti, for your introduction and for the comments you have made. Yeah, I think everybody is struggling and we know different from anyone else. We've had three quite devastating waves of COVID infections. This third wave with the Delta variant has been very difficult because it's been protracted and appears not to have completely settled down. But we were fortunate to get going with an early vaccination program from the 17th of February, uh, where we uh, had a, a pilot program running with Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And that came to an end on the 16th of May. And on the 17th of May, we started our national vaccination program. Uh, from the 17th of May until today, today we will cross our 13 million doses administered. We have uh, almost Today, we may cross the 10 million mark of uh, individuals who have received at least one vaccination, and we are now sitting at five and a half million individuals who are fully vaccinated. So that's, at the moment, 22.85% of the population has had at least one dose, and 14.2% who have had uh, a, um, this is of our adult population, who have been fully vaccinated. Uh, it's a very long way to go. We have... Um, uh, started our vaccination program with our 60 plus population. Then we opened up to the 50 to 59s and then uh, slowly but surely have moved down and we are now vaccinating all adults above the age of 18. Uh, the strategy that we've adopted has largely centered on three major components and then an overarching support structure. So the three components are vaccine security, and we've had lots of challenges with vaccine supply and vaccine security getting to the point where we are now. And in fact, on the 21st of June, I mean of July, we started to run out of vaccines. And fortunately, we've had some donations through COVAX, which got us past that point. But everyone knows we had uh, uh, problems across the globe with Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and that set us back a bit, and we haven't completely restored that flow of vaccine yet. The second major component is creating the capacity to vaccinate. And uh, we have worked very closely with our sizable private health sector, and we now have over 3,000 vaccination points that are vaccinating. Many of them also have outreach sites, and there are some mass vaccination sites amongst that as well. We then, the third component is the component we are now struggling with, and that is demand generation. Uh, it got going quite well in the beginning, and as each age group is open, there's always those who are very keen and who come for vaccination and then quite quickly tapers off 
with the anti-vaxxers uh, messaging being quite negative and with uh, some hesitancy, quite serious hesitancy. So we have now embarked on a very big demand creation strategy involving everybody. It has many components to it, part of which are outreach and making vaccines more readily accessible to people, transport improvements, uh, pop-up sites in villages and in malls and taxi ranks. Uh, but part of it is also about making sure that we give the right information widely across the country. We have a lot of very sus suspicious people. Um, the overarching um, planning and the monitoring and evaluation, we have installed an electronic vaccine data system, which makes it possible for us to collect a lot of data. It makes it possible for people to register and to be scheduled for vaccines. As of yesterday, there's also a self-scheduling uh, uh, portal that is now open and so slowly but surely we find things that will improve the vaccination rollout and adapt our systems but as Dr. Moeti said the trick I think to where from what we've seen of where our biggest successes are is local plans so although we put macro plans in place for the country and we work very closely with our provincial administrations we know that uh, at, at the local level where local media, local leaders, uh, religious leaders, tribal leaders, and so forth, where they interact with the population, that's where the major impact is going to come. So although we are happy that we are well on our way and we are making a lot of progress, we uh, know that it's a very long way to go. Uh, we have set a target to have vaccinated 70% of our adult population uh, with at least one dose before the end of this year. We are on target to do that at the moment, but we know that uh, creating that demand is going to be our single's biggest challenge. So with these initial comments, I think I will leave it at that point and we'll happily take questions later. Thank you, Dr. Moeti, for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Chris. Wow, 70% of the population, at least, at least one dose. That is an ex and you're still on track to do that. Great to hear that so many things and hesitancy that you've highlighted. So to you now, Dr. Hassan Abdul Nasser in Niger, let's also hear, can you tell us about how Niger is scaling up its COVID-19 vaccination? Merci bien. Donc, bonjour à tous. Merci à Dr. Mouti pour la parole qui a été donnée au Niger. Le Niger aussi... Nous avons, eu, euh, nous avons commencé la vaccination contre la COVID depuis le 29 mars. Euh, au niveau du pays, globalement, par rapport au camp, on est à plus de moins de 5500, mais malheureusement avec euh, presque 200 décès. Au début, la riposte, c'était la prise en charge, mais à partir du mois de mars, nous avons commencé aussi la vaccination. Euh, alors, la particularité du Niger est... Euh, C'est un pays assez vaste euh, avec euh, des régions assez, assez éloignées donc, par rapport au déploiement du vaccin. Là, nous avons dû travailler euh, avec euh, tous les partenaires, l'OMS, l'UNICEF, pour pouvoir couvrir euh, toutes les huit régions. On fait également face à un facteur très, très important qui est l'insécurité au niveau de, de, de trois régions, la frontière autour du bassin du lac Tchad, la frontière avec le Mali et le Burkina Faso, où euh, les équipes de vaccination ont des difficultés pour se déplacer. Mais malgré cela, nous avons pu, à partir du mois de mars, quand nous avions reçu le vaccin Sinopharm, ensuite le vaccin AstraZeneca, pu ouvrir plus de, au niveau de 72 départements, donc euh, placer des équipes de vaccination. Et pour aller au contact de communauté, euh, les équipes de vaccination se déplacent en mobile et en avancée pour aller au plus contact de communauté et trouver donc les populations et offrir la, la vaccination. Alors, euh, à ce jour, euh, nous avons, c'est vrai, une faible couverture de 4% puisque notre plan de déploiement, euh, nous avons prévu de toucher plus de euh, 10 millions de personnes. Mais là, il y a également la disponibilité même des vaccins. En tout et pour tout, le Niger avait bénéficié dans le cadre de la coopération bilatérale 
400 000 doses du vaccin Sinopharm et 25 000 doses du vaccin AstraZeneca avec la Chine et l'Inde. Et la facilité au COVAX, 355 000 doses. Donc, un peu moins de 780 000 doses pour pouvoir donc vacciner. C'est avec ces deux vaccins que nous avons pu toucher pour la première dose à peu près 410 000 personnes. Et maintenant, pour la, la complétude, on est autour de 1,20 Actuellement, pour les, les, les régions continuent à vacciner avec euh, le vaccin Sinopharm et Johnson Johnson qu'on a eu il y a trois et, et quatre semaines. Pour la stratégie que nous avons utilisée, d'abord, c'est d'assurer la permanence de la vaccination au niveau des sites fixes, notamment en milieu urbain. Milieu urbain, ce que j'appelle milieu urbain ici, ce sont les, 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 les chefs lieux des régions, les chefs lieux des départements et, et quelques grandes communes. Mais comme nous avons une population majoritairement rurale, nous avons alors organisé des campagnes de vaccination de masse. Et là, c'est des équipes qui se sont déplacées pour couvrir le village et Hamou et proposer et donc, la vaccination là. Ce qui nous a permis d'utiliser le vaccin. Par rapport à AstraZeneca, nous avons une contrainte parce que ça y avait les chances, c'était le 29 juillet passé où le vaccin est périmé. Mais avec la facilité au COVAX, UNICEF, OMS, nous avons de nouvelles dotations en vaccin, Johnson que j'ai cité, et AstraZeneca, que nous allons réceptionner incessamment pour assurer. Donc, la deuxième dose à ces populations rurales-là, qui, qui, qui va falloir retourner en cours, chercher et, et retrouver. Euh, donc, euh, en résumé, ce sont ces deux situations. La disponibilité d'une part euh, de vaccin et aussi aller trouver ces populations et l'adhésion maintenant des populations euh, à la vaccination. Euh, nous avons aussi au Niger connu une gestion assez difficile de, 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 la, de, de la désinformation qui a été largement véhiculée par les réseaux sociaux qui ont, euh, qui ont vraiment véhiculé beaucoup de faux messages pour attaquer la vaccination contre la COVID. Et là, nous avons mis en contribution les chefs religieux, les, 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 les autorités coutumières. Nous avons une forte empreinte ici de nos forces de nos chefs religieux, donc les chefs traditionnels. Nous avons passé par ces chefs traditionnels là pour sensibiliser la communauté. Étant entendu également, il y a eu tout l'apport des autorités administratives au plus haut niveau qui sont restés constamment avec nous pour sensibiliser les populations pour l'adhésion à la, à la vaccination. Euh, il y a un suivi euh, régulier et fait, que ce soit au niveau terrain, et également au niveau national pour accompagner donc, les acteurs de terrain euh, pour euh, euh, tous les efforts qui, que ces acteurs-là ont déployés pour pouvoir euh, donc, assurer la vaccination à ces, à ces populations. -là. Donc voilà globalement comment on s'est pris pour euh, euh, assurer la disponibilité, pour tenir compte de l'équité, donc assurer la disponibilité de vaccins anti-COVID-19 euh, sur toute euh, l'étendue de notre pays et aussi euh, continuer la communication à travers nos différents leaders pour euh, maintenir euh, euh, l'adhésion des, popula des populations. Sur ce dernier sur ce, ce sujet d'adhésion des populations, euh, on continue encore euh, à aller vers ces leaders, à utiliser donc, euh, le réseau de médias que nous avons, les radios de proximité, les radios qui ont une couverture euh, régionale et une couverture nationale pour davantage sensibiliser les populations avec tous les vaccins qui sont euh, annoncés. Parce qu'il y a une possibilité de vaccins au fur et à mesure à travers la facilité au COVAX et aussi la coopération bilatérale pour l'Union africaine que le pays va, va recevoir. Donc, euh, on est là-dessus pour pouvoir davantage sensibiliser nos populations ou d'une part qu'elles soient recrutées pour la première dose et aussi qu'elles répondre donc aux différents rendez-vous pour recevoir les deuxièmes doses. Et si, euh, voilà ce que le Niger a eu à faire euh, globalement pour euh, organiser la, la vaccination contre la COVID. 
Dr. Nasser for filling us in with what Niger is doing and indeed you're putting in a lot of effort to counter this hesitancy. Now that we've heard from all our panelists, it's your turn to ask questions, uh, dear journalists. And this, please, again, use the Q&A function and the Zoom up. We also have on hand Dr. Tieno Balde, the Deputy Incident Manager for COVID-19 Response, and Dr. Richard Mihigo, the Coordinator for Vaccine Preventable Diseases Program at the WHO Regional Office for Africa. So our first question uh, comes from NHK, George Mawashe, to Dr. Moeti and Dr. Crisp. What is needed for, the, for these African governments to increase their capacity to administer the vaccines? What do you think is required? And I'll start with you, Dr. Moeti. Okay, um, thank you very much for, for that question. First, I, I think we've heard from our two panelists what two governments have done to increase their capacity to deliver, to deliver the vaccines. And, and clearly, it's to make sure that they put in place the resources, they plan, they uh, estimate what, what quantities of vaccines are needed, the target population to be vaccinated, and then they ensure that they have the capacity, of course, for uh, acquiring storage of the vaccines under the, the correct uh, conditions. So cold storage is extremely important. The logistics of uh, transporting the vaccines to the sites where they need to be transported. And then very, uh, very importantly, then how to administer the vaccines, how to deliver the vaccine. So really, they need to think about uh, the operational modalities, the operational gaps to be field and how to continue to improve and adapt. And we heard from both countries how they have indeed started in what one way learned as they were going along and adapted. Clearly the countries also need to secure the financial resources to be able to carry out the vaccine delivery operations. And that is something that we have seen has been a bit of a challenge in the planning of our countries. The planning has to happen globally at the national level, at the sub-national level and very much micro planning at the local level, which needs to continue to be adapted. We've, we've also seen, and, and we've heard from uh, both panelists again, that the, it's not just the same vaccine that they have received, which would make life very simple. So the planning has to be adapted to different types of vaccines in terms of the cold storage needs of the vaccines, whether it's a single or a multiple dose vaccine, and um, the communication with people have to be organized that way. We, we uh, Countries are also having to mobilize the delivery capacities, what sort of sites uh, in urban areas, what sort of sites in rural areas, perhaps where people are more dispersed, uh, identifying places where people gather as opposed to using health facilities or pre-planned sites, and very much, um, to I said, ensuring that people then are able to register themselves for the vaccination process. So using both digital means and finding other means we, we, we have observed where countries can reach people through organizations, um, associations, sometimes even religious organizations or in more rural areas through associations of some, of some sort or other to at least be able to reach people, those who are connected electronically and digitally and many of our people are not, particularly the elderly initial group at the lower income scale, we may have to find other ways of, uh, of reaching people. And then most importantly, is the need then to put in place a data system so that countries can monitor and know how the vaccination rollout is going. So we believe that one of the most important things is to be analyzing how this process is proceeding, uh, learning and adapting. We've recommended that countries periodically carry out interaction reviews to understand what have been the bottlenecks, what have been some of the challenges, what are they learning, and then what are they putting forward. And then finally, uh, from the very beginning and continuing throughout the, 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 the campaigns, of course, is the need to communicate with people. I think that's also been articulated very well by our, by our two panelists. Thank you, Dr. Moeti. Dr. Crisp, would you have something to add to that? 
Yeah, thank you very much. I think Dr. Moeti has um, done a very good job of answering the question, but maybe I'll just uh, re-emphasize something and add to it. And that is that every country is completely different. And across your country, you will find, obviously, the circumstances are completely different. So while you do need to have national planning and uh, purchase the vaccines and distribute it as a national program, the interaction on the ground is obviously very, very different. We have a huge dichotomy in our country between the um, private and our public sector, and we've had to harness both of those sectors and try and integrate them, which is actually quite good news since we're moving towards a national health insurance system. But it's had to be accelerated because we couldn't have only the insured people going to the private sector and the uninsured going to the public sector. So we've had to create mechanisms for reimbursement for the effort that has been put into the, the actual vaccinations where the private sector sites are vaccinating uninsured people and public sector sites are also vaccinating insured people so that we are using proximity rather than ability to pay. Now that might be something that is unique to our environment, but uh, I'm just using it as an example to, to support the things that Dr. Moetu was saying. What we have found uh, regarding digital technology is that um, even the places where, and South Africa still does have some very rural areas where there is no digital connection, you can still use a digital system with push technology. And we have found that using outreach into the communities, particularly supported by the local leaders, religious leaders, traditional leaders, and so forth. Um, the rural areas have done better than the urban areas in vaccinating their elderly people, which was a big surprise to us. We thought we would struggle to get hold of 60 years and older because of the technological method that we have embarked on using cell phones for capturing information, the, the data of uh, people when they register and so forth. That has not been the case. And uh, with the use of the primary healthcare system, it has actually gone very smoothly in rural areas. What I think made the difference is that the primary healthcare system in the rural areas is very strong. Using community health workers, which are in, they are in less abundance in urban communities than they are in the rural areas. And because they are used to being understaffed, uh, the way in which they utilize their resources in these rural areas has been nothing short of miraculous. So uh, trusting the staff on the ground to get the local solutions right is important, but then you have to give them the tools from the center to enable them to do it. And those have been very big lessons for us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So a uh, question still from NHK uh, to you, Dr. Mihigo. How unfortunate is it that some African countries cannot administer all the vaccines they receive from COVAX and, that ha and these have to be thrown away? Now, um, no, I, I think we need to, uh, to put things into perspective. Um, uh, I think at the beginning of the press conference, Dr. Moiti provided um, uh, the overall statistics in terms of the vaccine rollout in the region. So we have a close to 143 million doses that we have received. And out of this 100 million, 101 million have been administered, which is quite representing close to 70% of all the doses that we have received have been administered. And we have seen that there has been acceleration in the last month in terms of uh, number of doses, but also in terms of the delivery. So when we looked at the number of doses that have been uh, um, expired in the region, we are uh, around roughly 800,000 uh, doses only, which represents more or less 0.7% of all the doses that have been uh, administered. So this is not really uh, a, a big number. And we need also to understand that um, uh, there are reasons sometimes to explain that because many of these doses uh, arrived in the country with a very, very short expiry date. And I think the country have done quite a tremendous job in trying to deliver very quickly uh, the vaccine with short uh, life, uh, shelf lives uh, uh, to uh, save more lives. So I think when we looked even outside Africa in other regions, compared to the rate of just say close to 0.7% of doses that has been wasted, we have seen that they have even higher uh, uh, expiry dates uh, 
data from the US, for instance, we are seeing few states that um, North Carolina, for instance, as close to 1 million doses that are going to expire. So this is not a situation proper to Africa. Our country are managing quite uh, very well this situation. WHO is providing a very handy support to make sure that every dose that arrives in the country is also getting in the arm of someone to save lives. So there is need to do better, but uh, I think relatively uh, there is a lot of effort that also are being done to minimize these uh, effects. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, thanks, Richard. So it's not as bad as it's purported to be. So now we have a couple of uh, Ebola questions, and I'll give the first one to you, Dr. Moeti. This is coming from Imo Edet with West Africa Democracy Radio. And it says, do you think the Ebola scare in Cote d'Ivoire can be classified as misinformation to the globe? And then uh, again from uh, Imo uh, in uh, West Africa Democracy Radio, and this will go to you, Dr. Balde Tieno. If the Ebola lady wasn't sick of Ebola in Cote d'Ivoire, what then was the ailment? And the next one to you again, uh, Dr. Balde from Liane de Bassompierre in, from Bloomberg in Abidjan. Uh, says, how much money and resources were spent on the Ebola case that turned out to be a misdiagnosis? Over to you, Dr. Moeti. Uh, thank you very much. So, so was this a misinformation to the globe? Um, I would say not. I, I think that uh, sometimes when there is a suspicion of something that is highly um, threatening, like a case of Ebola in a country like Cote d'Ivoire, especially somebody who has traveled from a country that's undergoing currently an outbreak, admittedly not in an area where currently the, the cases were, but into a big city like Abidjan. Then the choice is, do you do something in order to contain the situation rapidly? Or do you wait until you have absolutely confirmed that it is a case of Ebola before you start to take action. Uh, my view is that uh, it was very important to make sure that this, this person who had traveled through several hundred kilometers from Guinea into Abidjan, touching various points on her own route and arrived in a, a big city like, like Abidjan, that as we say in the area of emergencies, it's better to take the no regrets approach, that is take rapid action, make sure that everything that needed to be done, including informing the public, of course, taking the fastest way to confirm the case, that did take a little bit of time. Uh, a specimen had to be sent to a laboratory in France to get the final confirmation that in fact, it was not a case, but it was then immediately important to inform the community, con trace the contacts of this person, and even start to vaccinate her, her family back in Guinea where she had started her journey. And, and also for the countries to work together, uh, Cote d'Ivoire and Guinea, there was a very good partnership, sharing of vaccine supplies, et cetera. <clears throat> so if the countries had waited and this had turned out to be a case over the days that it took to get the confirmation, by then there would have been cases, contacts infected and a situation that was, would potentially be out of control. So I'm afraid uh, I do not, think that this was misinforming uh, the world. I think this was a responsible action taken. And then in the end, the evidence told us that it was not in fact a case of Ebola. Uh, thank you. Just uh, to add on Dr. Uh, Dr. Moeti's point, I think it's quite important now that uh, the Ebola, I mean, has been rolled out as a diagnostic uh, and investigation are currently ongoing for finding really the real causes of the disease of the person who was identified. So the investigation are ongoing for the moment. Uh, there's no really uh, clear information about the exact diagnostic of that person. But uh, uh, from the information that we know that we have is that the person is doing quite very well for the moment and uh, and uh, the investigation are ongoing. Uh, 
And again, just to build on Dr. Moiti's point, I think all of the action which has been taken, I mean, since uh, the, 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 the suspicion of these cases, I think this is something that needs to be applauded. And uh, we have seen, I mean, other, in other situation where this can, I mean, lead us, I mean, if ever, I mean, appropriate action has not taken. On the WHO side, uh, I mean, some amount of money were mobilized and uh, usually for this type of emergencies, uh, we have uh, the contingency uh, fund for emergencies, the WHO contingency fund for emergencies and we mobilize around 500,000 USD for kicking off the response actions but obviously all of this amount has not been used for the critical actions which has been conducted so far about I mean mobilizing additional experts to bring them in the country to provide all of the technical necessary support to Cote d'Ivoire but also uh, I mean to mobilize all of these different vaccines and to follow up the contacts both in Cote d'Ivoire and in Guinea. This is from the WHO side for sure all the resources has been mobilized by the national health authorities both in Cote d'Ivoire, but at the meantime also in Guinea and other partners. But again, I think this is quite a good example of a reactive, a positive, a reactive actions, you know, for really controlling the situation wherever I mean it happen. Thank you. Very well appreciated, um, Balde. Thank you very much. The next question goes to you, Dr. Mihigo and also to Dr. Crisp can add something. It's from Rhoda with uh, Diambo with uh, BBC. Earlier on, the WHO was against rich countries vaccinating young people before Africa vaccinates its high-risk groups. What does WHO think about Morocco and Zimbabwe vaccinating children between the ages of 12 and 17? Should they have waited a little longer, considering that only 2% of African population is vaccinated? No, thank you uh, very much, Fiona. And I think this is a very important point. Well, I think we, we, we are still uh, uh, advocating, and I think uh, all the uh, uh, element is pointing that uh, the more we reach the uh, vulnerable groups, uh, those who are more at risk uh, of getting the disease, I think the better. Um, we have seen uh, uh, the statistics that were presented uh, uh, by Dr. Moet at the beginning, uh, the, the, the objective of reaching 10% that we are still really very far from it. So I think we need to rally all our effort and focus to make sure that uh, uh, as many people as possible in the region uh, can get access to the vaccine, particularly those who are really at a very high uh, risk. Having said that, um, we are seeing now more and more data that are starting to emerge uh, that is showing as well that the um, um, burden of disease, particularly in the younger people, has become quite uh, evident. And particularly with this uh, new uh, Delta variant that is now, as we know, predominant in many parts of, of the region. So I, I think that the uh, recommendation that was made by WHO is still stand uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, reaching to the vulnerable group, making sure that we can save those who are more uh, at risk. But in the meantime, uh, some of the decisions that member states can take, uh, you, may, you point out the example of Morocco, which has done quite a very good job in, uh, uh, in protecting uh, most of the vulnerable people. I think it's based on some of these evidence, I believe that these, those countries have moved to the next level. Uh, we heard also from South Africa that now, uh, they've done a very well strategy in uh, vaccinating, starting by the elderly people going down now, they're vaccinating all the people 18 years and above. And I think this is what a uh, country needs to do by uh, prioritizing those who are more at risk. And when those have been uh, covered, then uh, strategy can be expanded to reach more uh, uh, target group. Over. Thanks, uh, Richard. Uh, over to you, Dr. Crisp, if you have any addition. Yes, thanks very much. So to also just to add, I'm, I don't want to differ at all. Um, so in our case, we have the Delta variant, which is by far the predominant variant now during our third wave. And we have seen that the most vulnerable populations are those over 60 years of age, by far. They are far more vulnerable and far getting far sicker than anybody with any other comorbidities at any other age. We also see that from 50, it's, um, it's almost as high a risk. And it's a lower risk, except for certain uh, comorbidities in younger people. 
we have seen children infected and some quite badly infected and have in fact had deaths amongst children as well, even very small children. So there's no doubt that COVID does no longer spares anybody and attacks uh, all ages. But if we are to look at return on our uh, investment in terms of the vaccines we have available and keeping people out of hospital, that's our big challenge. We um, are clogging up all the intensive care units, every single oxygen point, and uh, many of our primary health care systems to deal with ill people, very severely ill people. And that means there's not enough care for people who have other non-COVID conditions. So part of the strategy is to identify who are those most vulnerable people and how do we get to them quickly, very quickly. So the, um, the strategy of uh, vaccinating the 60 pluses has paid dividends because in most parts of the country, more than 50% of that sector of the population is vaccinated. And in fact, in some parts, it's more than 60% of that cohort are now vaccinated, uh, most of them fully vaccinated. The 50 pluses have uh, lost a bit of interest in us and we need to generate some, some more, some more um, demand from that sector of the population, but it's still a very good coverage. The challenge was, what do you do with people who genuinely do have comorbidities? And for instance, there was pressure on us to vaccinate pregnant women. And at that stage, we had not rolled out beyond 35 years of age. And the bulk of people who are pregnant, women who are pregnant, are between 18 and 35 and some younger than 18. But you have to hold the line in order to get a firm, solid program in place. The administrative distractions and the initial, the additional administration to cherry pick out certain people for specific needs is extremely time consuming and administratively burdensome. So we have picked a particular approach. We will at some point, I'm sure, uh, get to the point of vaccinating children between the age of 12 and 18, but we are not at that point now. So we're not going to be critical of other countries who have got to that point, um, because we are pretty sure that it's going to be necessary going down the line. For now, we are using Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson vaccines, and they are very effective against the Delta variant. We are in the process of, we have registered both AstraZeneca and uh, Sinopharm, uh, Sinovac uh, uh, vaccines, but they are not rolled out as part of the program at the moment for various uh, conditional reasons and we may well implement them later. And that will give us a bigger armamentarium, and we'll see what happens with the variants once this um, particular wave is over. So I think that the bottom line here is that if you've only got so many vaccines and so much capacity to vaccinate, go for the most vulnerable communities so that you protect them from ending up in your hospitals, your ICUs, and dying. Thank you. Great. So now to you, Dr. Moeti, and uh, this is a question from Ochere, two questions from Ochere at Voice of America. Are more of the, of the cases reported on the continent preventable if African countries get fair access to vaccines? And the other question is, is the resurgence driven by the Delta variant further stretching already strained health systems on the continent? And then the last question will be to you, Dr. Uh, Mihigo, which also comes from uh, Voice of America. And it is, uh, we, we hear about people getting booster shots uh, in, in Africa. Should we be discussing booster shots in Africa right now? Um, okay. Uh, thanks very much. So, so the, the, the first case uh, about uh, what would be the impact of vaccines on the on the resurgence and on transmission and spread of the disease of of course vaccines we have said will to some degree reduce the transmission of the disease but we know that they do not eliminate it altogether uh, i think it's been very well said that uh, one of the main aims of uh, vaccinating people is to prevent severe illness and to prevent stop, stop people dying of, of the of the disease. So I would say that the continued transmission needs both vaccines and also needs the public health measures at the individual level and uh, all the other measures about minimizing um, 
gatherings of, of, of a type, especially indoor gatherings that increase people being close together and transmitting the, vis the, the virus among them. And one needs then to be monitoring how severe is the situation, what is actually happening here to go the range between lockdowns and um, individual measures combined with vaccine. Of course, the more we vaccinate the population and that, that aim of uh, reaching uh, a level of 70% uh, or so of the vaccine of the population covered to acquire uh, shared immunity within the vaccine within the vaccinated population and therefore to reduce the need for these individual and other public health measures is one of the main objectives of vaccinating people. So I would say that yes, vaccines will have an impact on transmission and on the spread of the virus. It's, they need to be monitored carefully with combination of uh, using masks, uh, keeping a distance, not gathering indoors, particularly as the vaccination uh, coverage is increasing. Um, and then the second question about well, whether the, the Delta is uh, stretching health system, I think that has already been uh, responded to very well by Dr. Crisp giving the example of South Africa is more transmissible. So one person who is infected is going to infect more people and therefore the likelihood of getting within that group of those who are infected people who are of a profile in terms of age, existing conditions to become severely ill and to fill up the healthcare systems and therefore to push out or to absorb the capacity to deal with other health problems is, is, is higher the more the, the Delta variant is circulating and that is what is being observed. We've seen in quite a few countries in this current wave where the Delta is predominant that our healthcare facilities in quite a few countries have really been overwhelmed, uh, the bed capacity, the oxygen capacity, and then the capacity to deal with other problems has really been severely challenged. Dr. Mehigo, you want to tell us if we should be talking of booster doses in Africa at this point in time? Thank you, Fiona. I, I think this is a, a really an interesting question. I think if we look at the statistics uh, that we have today, 3% only, 3% on uh, African people have been uh, fully vaccinated. And if we looked at sub-Saharan Africa, this number drops to 1.6% uh, of the population that have been uh, vaccinated. So we have heard a lot from Dr. Crisp and uh, Dr. Moiti that really what do we what should we do to get our priority right in, in, in this continent i think we still have a lot of vulnerable people we still have a lot of elderly people who have not yet even received one single shot of, of, the, of the vaccine and these are the people unfortunately with now the data variants that end up in the icus in the hospital and etc so i think that our effort really um, uh, we should not distract country to to move towards that goal, to make everything that it can take to increase the capacity of a vaccine rollout in the, in, in the country, to reach as many people as possible with the uh, two dose or one dose, depending on the product, so that at least uh, protection can be afforded. And then lastly, I will say that uh, the, the data that uh, 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 we, we're having now are still showing that um, the uh, two doses of vaccines or one dose, depending on the product, are still very efficient in protecting uh, people for severe disease and hospitalization and ultimately preventing death, which is one of the major outcomes that we are looking for. So I think our priority, country's priority for the moment should be really to increase the capacity to reach as many people as possible before starting to launch the debate of a third or a booster dose in our, in our community. Thank you very much. In short, protect as many people as possible. So as we come towards the end, now we have the last question that I'll send to you, uh, Dr. Nasser from Niger. Uh, it comes from Patricia Pamploma from uh, Fola de São Paulo in Brazil. And it says, what kind of initiatives are being put in place to deliver vaccines to remote locations? Merci bien euh, cette question pour euh, les, les zones reculées. Donc, euh, je l'avais dit en 
on, on, on envoie des équipes de vaccination euh, euh, en, en mobile, donc avec des véhicules, des équipes de vaccination pour aller trouver euh, tous ces villages-là qui sont euh, assez régulés. Certainement, cette activité est planifiée. Donc, les districts sanitaires, les régions euh, font la planification pour identifier, par exemple, le couloir de passage pour les populations nomades, euh, les, 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 tous les points où il y a un accès difficile parce que c'est éloigné, parce qu'il y a d'autres contraintes euh, géographiques. Donc, en tenant compte de cette planification, et comme nous organisons des, des campagnes, nous allions nous allouons beaucoup plus de ressources à ces districts euh, identifiés pour qu'ils puissent aller donc, au contact de cette communauté. On déplace en quelque sorte les services de vaccination là, vers ces populations éloignées qui ont un accès très difficile euh, aux services de vaccination. Et c'est comme ça qu'on arrive au fur et à mesure euh, au niveau de tout le pays. Et j'avais parlé de la sécurité des zones où nous avons la sécurité. Là, les équipes de vaccination se font accompagner par les forces de défense et de sécurité, là également pour aller vers ces différentes populations-là. C'est tout euh, nous, avec ces différentes stratégies que nous arrivons à atteindre les populations assez éloignées. Merci, Aubi. OK, thank you very much. I will see that since we had a late start, we have some questions that are still burning and we have a question that comes from daniel arab moy from cgtn and this go to you dr tieno balde has who listed the c12 uh, variant in uh, south africa as a variant of concern and how dangerous is this variant compared to the delta variant uh, thank you, uh, Fiona, for the question. Uh, the variant C.1.2 has not been considered for the moment by the WHO as a variant of concern. It's really a variant under investigation. It's a variant, I mean, the mutation of this virus is a kind of normal and natural process. And uh, with the system which has been established by the World Health Organization you know, for doing a kind of genomic surveillance, that's how this uh, new variant has been discovered. And uh, for the moment, we have seen uh, some uh, mutation which are somehow similar, I mean, to the Delta variant. And those mutations has occurred quite very quickly, quite very rapidly. But uh, the investigation are ongoing. And for the moment, we are having almost 100 cases which has been reported in South Africa around uh, this new variant. But uh, the investigation are ongoing for the moment. So it's not a variant of concern for the moment. Thank you and over. All right, and now we go to you, Dr. Moeti, uh, with uh, also another burning question that comes from the BMJ. Uh, so for Mira Sentlingam, though vaccine supplies are now coming in more rapidly, targets are still short and may not be met. What needs to be done on the continent to prepare for the consequences of targets falling short? Um, okay, thank you. Uh, first, before answering that question, I'd just like to add something about this variant C.1.2, that al although it may have been found in South Africa, it's also been found in other countries. Um, so so I, I mean, just to dispel the idea that it might again be labeled as some sort of South African variant, it's occurring, in, it's been identified in three other countries in the African region, and overall, I believe in about nine countries, globally. So it's, it's a variant that's uh, emerging um, in, in several countries. Um, so the question, what should we, how should we be preparing for the fact that we may not be reaching the targets with, with the vaccination? Uh, I mean, first of all, just to emphasize that, and I heard, I think we heard from our panelists from two very different countries, one a middle-income country, relatively urbanized, uh, relatively connected and the other a very big country with uh, mainly rural population, uh, <clears throat> security issues, access issues, how the countries are really working very hard, how the governments working with partners, private sector and the, and the communities are really working very hard to uh, make the vaccine available to people. 
um, again, every effort, and we are working very hard with countries now to prepare and gear up for the fact that vaccines are going to be becoming more and more available in all the ways that we've mentioned, the planning, the micro planning, putting in place systems, working with partners, mobilizing the population. That's what needs to be done. And that's what I believe African governments working with partners like WHO and others are determinedly preparing for. If we don't reach the targets that we are aiming at, I believe we will continue. I, I think we must also uh, remember that the vaccine is a very important tool but it's not the only means of minimizing deaths and severe illness and the overwhelming of our public health and other health systems by, by the virus. The, the, the means that I have uh, mentioned, uh, encouraging people, supporting people to continue to play their part in terms of the preventive measures, the mask wearing, keeping a distance, um, making sure that um, people in different spheres are protected from um, from transmission and from being infected by the virus are things that we can sustain. Admittedly, that becomes very exhausting for the population. It needs uh, sustaining lots of effort and it needs people being supported to do their part. So I think we are, the vaccine is an extremely important tool, but there are other things that can also be done in addition uh, so that even if we have to shift, which we are hoping not to do the, the timelines in terms of the targets, we have other means to continue to save lives. That, for us, is the most important thing to continue to do. Excellent. Thank you again, Dr. Moeti. We are now coming to the end of this virtual press conference. Now let's turn to our three panelists and hear any final messages, and I'll give you one minute each, and I'll start with you, Dr. Uh, Nasser from Niger. Merci bien. Euh, on me il est dit tout au long de, de ces discussions, en tout cas, à ce qui concerne le Niger, le défi est encore très, très, très important. Euh, nous avons encore un faible taux de couverture vaccinale. Euh, heureusement, de plus en plus, nous allons recevoir euh, du vaccin. Et nous travaillons d'arrache-pied avec euh, nos partenaires de proximité, avec euh, la société civile, avec... Euh, les secteurs privés pour davantage euh, offrir cette vaccination aux populations euh, qui en ont besoin. Et je crois qu'à terme, avec tous ces différents efforts, on va améliorer euh, donc cette couverture vaccinale et continuer à, à protéger nos, nos populations. Euh, tout le monde est mobilisé, donc le partenaire qui nous accompagne. Euh, le, le, le gouvernement, de plus en plus, même la population continue à demander euh, du vaccin. On a vu avec euh, la rupture qu'on a eue l'attente de deuxième dose. Et je crois que ce nouveau élan nous permettra euh, de, de, de toucher davantage ces différentes populations. Et aussi, également, malgré cette contingence de la COVID-19, en ce qui concerne notre pays, c'est de continuer les efforts pour... Euh, maintenir les efforts de la vaccination de routine pour qu'après, on n'ait pas encore à gérer les maladies qu'on a pu éviter jusqu'à maintenant par rapport à la vaccination. C'est avec la conjugaison de tous ces efforts qu'on arrivera à améliorer l'état de santé de nos populations. Merci beaucoup. Merci de participer à ce panel. Great uh, uh, for those words. Now to you, Dr. Nicholas Crisp, for your final words. Thanks very much. And also, thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this. I think for us, the message is very similar that uh, vaccines save lives. We have very clear evidence that if you are not vaccinated, your chance of ending up sick, sometimes very sick and dying, is far higher than if you have been vaccinated. We continue to collect the evidence to show what that actually uh, means. We will continue to monitor. This is something that's very new, so we know there will be more variants. We will monitor what, when the vaccine immunity wanes so that when it is necessary to start with booster shots, we are ready. And we'll continue to be as responsible as possible to make sure that uh, the vaccination program is not 
uh, overwhelming and therefore exclusive of the rest of the health services, because that is a challenge at the moment, that we lose momentum in our HIV programs, TB programs, our other immunization programs. But at the same time, we need to make sure that our clinical services are supported. The staff who work in those hospitals have been under tremendous pressure for a very long period of time. There's a lot of mental health challenges amongst those personnel. They've lost family members. And uh, all of us need to rally together and help one another. There's no country that's going to do this alone. We need to get together to make sure that we get the vaccines and uh, that we get them into people's arms. Thank you very much once more. Thank you very much for those great ones. And to you now, Dr. Moeti. Um, yes, um, thanks very much, Fiona. Uh, first, uh, merci beaucoup de nous avoir joindre uh, au Dr. Um, Abdul Nasser, and, and I thank uh, as well Dr. Nicholas Crisp for having joined us. Thank you very much to all the journalist colleagues, as usual, for having joined us and for the work you do in informing uh, the public policy makers about this very important matter. I think I can only echo what has been said by uh, by my two, my co-panelists, and also add that we are reaching a phase now after a very painful pause in access to vaccine supplies in Africa, where we expect these to start to speed up. So we are encouraging everyone, particularly members of the public, to come forward and be vaccinated when it's your turn to be vaccinated. This, this is the the, the compact, I would say, that we need to sign with each other as individuals, as family members, as citizens. Uh, we can do our part by coming forward when it's our turn to be vaccinated. So we contribute to all that needs to be done to spare our health systems from being overwhelmed by COVID-19. And then uh, we are here to work very hard with the governments, with other partners, to make sure that every single vaccine that can be acquired in Africa is rolled out and provided to the population as quickly as possible. Uh, so I, I would just like to, to finish by saying, indeed, we're all in it together globally. We continue to appeal for the solidarity at the global level and for those countries that have got uh, more vaccine doses than they need, for those countries that have got more vaccine dose uh, production capacity than they are using to donate and to release for procurement by platforms like uh, the African Union's uh, task team that's acquiring vaccines so that we move along together as a world in covering the proportions of our population and make the world safe for everyone. So thank you all very much. Thank you again, Dr. Moeti, for all and everybody for all those words of wisdom. Our journalists, we don't take it for granted that you keep coming. We thank you for the excellent job to continuously write and uh, broadcast the right information out to the masses. I wish you all a very great September. And for our Francophone reporters, our experts, Drs. Tieno, Tieno Balde and Richard Mihigo will stay online for a few more minutes to answer your questions in French. Do enjoy your day and stay safe. Oui, bonjour, bonjour et bienvenue à cette partie entièrement en français de la, la conférence de presse euh, du bureau régional de l'OMS pour l'Afrique. Comme il a été dit, nous avons deux de nos experts euh, pour répondre à vos questions. Le docteur Tierno Baldé, qui est responsable adjoint de la réponse aux urgences, et le docteur Richard Migo, qui est coordinateur du programme de vaccination. Et cette première question ira au docteur Miigo. C'est une question de Alphonse Kenlogo de l'agence Anadolu au Togo. Et c'est une question qui concerne la production des vaccins en Afrique, en dehors de l'Afrique du Sud. Quels sont les pays africains qui sont actuellement prospectés pour la, la production de, de vaccins made in Africa euh, Quels sont ceux qui ont déjà commencé euh, la préparation de, de, de ce vaccin Et enfin, quel est le rôle précis que joue l'OMS aux côtés des, des pays qui sont engagés ou alors en cours d'engagement dans la production des vaccins contre le COVID-19 en Afrique Docteur Miego, c'est à vous. Oui, merci. Merci beaucoup pour cette question. 
En effet, le, euh, le processus de production de vaccins euh, a commencé à prendre un certain, une, une bonne direction dans la, dans la région africaine. Pour le moment, euh, nous avons euh, un certain nombre de pays qui ont déjà commencé à produire des vaccins. Nous avons l'Afrique du Sud qui produit déjà le vaccin de Johnson Johnson. Nous avons l'Égypte qui produit le vaccin de Sinovac, mais également le Maroc qui produit le vaccin de Sinopharm. Mais au-delà de ça, et surtout pour amplifier le rôle de l'OMS, l'OMS est en train d'apporter un appui technique important pour l'initiative de la création de hubs de production de vaccins au niveau, du, au niveau du continent africain. Un certain nombre de pays dans la région sont considérés. Le premier hub qui a été lancé récemment, c'est en Afrique du Sud, qui va également servir de cadre de, de, de formation d'autres pays pour notamment la production de vaccins utilisant la technologie du ARN messager. C'est des choses qui vont prendre un peu de temps, mais nous pensons que dans les 12 à 18 mois à venir, nous pourrons avoir une capacité installée pour la production de vaccins à travers ce hub de l'Afrique du Sud. Bien sûr, en plus de ce qui est en train d'être fait avec la production du vaccin Johnson Johnson. Nous avons également suivi, il y a je crois, deux semaines, le Sénégal qui a, et le Rwanda qui ont signé des accords de partenariat et également pour installer des capacités locales de production de vaccins à ARN à messager. Donc, il y a beaucoup de choses qui commencent à bouger et l'OMS est en train de jouer un rôle de facilitation important dans ce processus de renforcement des capacités pour être sûr que les agences nationales de réglementation des vaccins qui devront à terme autoriser ces vaccins sont renforcées, sont compétentes et, et, et capables de performer cette, cette fonction régulière de, ré, de, ré, de réglementation assez essentielle. Nous, nous intervenons également dans le processus de renforcement de capacité, notamment à travers le hub qui va être installé en Afrique du Sud, mais également dans ces autres pays, en collaboration, par exemple, avec nos collègues de l'Africa CDC et de l'Union africaine. Donc, il y a beaucoup de choses qui se font pour le moment dans ce domaine et ça va aller en, en s'accélérant dans les semaines à venir. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, docteur Migo. Euh, la prochaine question, euh, j'aimerais l'adresser à docteur Baldé. C'est une question aussi de, de Alphonse Kenlogo, qui est donc correspondant au Togo de l'agence Anadolu. Euh, C'est une question qui euh, concerne le nouveau variant euh, qui a été trouvé en Afrique du Sud. Il en était question un peu plus tôt, mais euh, visiblement, il est nécessaire d'y revenir. Quelles sont les, les informations que nous avons au sujet de, de ce variant Quel est son, son degré de virulence ou ses spécificités Oui, euh, merci bien pour la question. Effectivement, le variant que l'on a désigné pour le moment, C.1.2, c'est le nouveau variant, donc issu de la mutation donc, du, du, du virus, en fait, de la COVID-19. Euh, donc, euh, qui a montré donc, des mutations assez fréquentes. C'est ce qui a fait un peu son l'inquiétude d'un peu que ça génère. Il y a eu des mutations donc, de façon rapide et puis de façon assez fréquente donc, sur le matériel génétique donc, de ce virus-là. Donc, euh, euh, c'est un variant que nous suivons, en fait, comme beaucoup d'autres variants. Donc, c'est dans, dans la classification de l'OMS, il y a des variants donc, que l'on met, euh, met sous investigation. Et il y a des variants que l'on met quelque part euh, comme, comme constituant en fait une menace qu'on appelle en anglais donc variant of concern. Donc pour le moment, nous n'avons pas vraiment, les investigations sont en train d'être poursuivies donc pour pouvoir mieux euh, appréhender un peu toutes les conséquences donc de ce nouveau variant-là, autant en termes donc, de transmissibilité, mais aussi en termes donc de sévérité. C'est une fois que toutes ces informations-là seront collectées que nous pourrons donc en ce moment-là classifier un peu ce variant-là s'il reste sous un variant euh, à inquiétude ou un variant à non-inquiétude. Et comme le disait tout à l'heure le docteur Moïti, évidemment, euh, la, la, la majorité des cas actuellement, une centaine de cas qui ont été détectés, l'ont été euh, 
euh, en Afrique du Sud, mais aussi à d'autres pays, donc notamment en RDC, mais également donc à, au Botswana et au Zimbabwe et, et dans les îles Maurice, euh, donc où ce variant-là a été détecté. Donc, euh, pour le moment, c'est un variant que nous suivons de façon vraiment très, 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 très proche euh, que nous, pour que nous puissions comprendre vraiment tous les effets potentiels de ce variant-là. Mais pour le moment, ce n'est pas un variant qui cause des inquiétudes majeures pour le moment. -là. Merci. Merci, docteur Baldé. Je vais me tourner de nouveau vers vous, docteur Migo, avec deux questions qui sont, qui sont très proches. La première est de euh, Ignace Djikibo de la radio euh, Guémont FM euh, en Côte d'Ivoire, euh, qui est très d'actualité puisqu'il s'agit de la rentrée des classes en Afrique subsaharienne qui, euh, qui a lieu là, au cours des, des semaines qui viennent. Euh, Qu'est-ce qui est fait euh, de concert avec les États pour encourager les enseignants à adhérer au vaccin et la deuxième question qui est très proche, qui nous vient de Elvis Serge Sa du quotidien Éco Santé au Cameroun, euh, toujours à propos de cette rentrée imminente, euh, est-ce qu'il ne faudrait pas abaisser l'âge de la vaccination à tous les enfants de plus de 12 ans, comme c'est le cas aux États-Unis ou dans certains pays européens Docteur Migo. Ok, merci beaucoup. Euh... Je crois que c'est déjà une très bonne nouvelle que l'école, les, les classes vont réouvrir parce que après tout ce que nous avons connu comme restriction, je crois que c'est déjà une bonne, un bon pas en avant. Alors, en ce qui concerne les précautions, nous, effectivement, notre département de, qui s'occupe de tout ce qui est mobilisation et renforcement de la communauté de la communication au niveau communautaire, travaille étroitement avec les pays pour être sûr que la rentrée scolaire se passe dans des conditions correctes au niveau de tous les États, notamment que les élèves rentrent en classe dans des conditions d'hygiène, mais également des conditions de santé qui sont édictées dans le cadre de la lutte de manière générale contre COVID-19. Alors, pour ce qui concerne les enseignants, nous avons heureusement vu que dans beaucoup de pays, les enseignants ont été considérés comme un groupe prioritaire et ont été ciblés de manière spécifique pour être vaccinés en prévision de la rentrée scolaire et même avant que les vacances d'été que nous, nous, nous venons de, 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 de clôturer. Donc, il reste certainement à encourager le, les autres enseignants qui ne sont pas encore vaccinés, mais je pense que ça, c'est dans la plupart des pays inscrit dans leur stratégie de sensibilisation et de euh, mobilisation des, des groupes prioritaires euh, pour être sûr qu'ils euh, soient protégés et, euh, et puissent mener à, à bien à leurs occupations. En ce qui concerne d'abaisser l'âge de la vaccination, je crois que nous, nous l'avons discuté dans la première partie de, la, euh, de cette conférence de presse. Je crois que la priorité réellement pour le moment, c'est de faire en sorte à ce que euh, les, les, les cibles prioritaires puissent d'abord être couvertes les personnes les plus vulnérables. Je voudrais encore rappeler qu'au niveau du, de l'Afrique, seul 3 de la population est complètement vaccinée. Et dans, en Afrique subsaharienne, ce chiffre malheureusement tombe à 1,6 des personnes qui sont uniquement vaccinées. Donc, l'objectif réellement premier pour le moment, c'est de faire en sorte à ce que nous puissions atteindre au maximum les personnes les plus vulnérables, les personnes âgées qui sont malheureusement les plus à risque de tomber malade, soit gravement, ou d'être hospitalisé. Et lorsque certainement les vaccins seront disponibles, on pourrait envisager à descendre l'âge d'éligibilité à la vaccination, comme on l'a vu maintenant, beaucoup de pays vaccinent au-delà des 18 ans tout le monde. Mais si nous avons suffisamment de vaccins, et je pense qu'il y aura possibilité effectivement d'ouvrir la vaccination à beaucoup plus d'âge de groupe d'âge, même le plus jeune. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, docteur Amigo. Je vais me tourner de nouveau vers vous, docteur Baldé, pour une dernière question qui va nous projeter sur l'après-Covid. C'est une question de Ignace Gitibo de la radio Guémont FM en Côte d'Ivoire et qui s'interroge sur les financements des programmes de redressement, redressement post-Covid. D'où proviennent-ils euh, proviennent ces financements et, et comment envisage-t-on l'après-Covid 
Euh, merci, c'est une très bonne question, une question aussi d'actualité. Il faut mentionner euh, que la COVID, c'est vrai, c'est une maladie euh, par définition, mais qui a eu des conséquences donc, qui vont au-delà du système de santé, donc, euh, qui embrasse beaucoup d'autres secteurs, et on l'a vu, donc, les secteurs économiques, les secteurs sociaux, les secteurs culturels, secteurs éducatifs aussi. Donc, je pense qu'il y a une démarche actuellement euh, qui est extra-sectorielle, multisectorielle, donc, qui est en train d'être mise en place donc, pour pouvoir faire ce plan de... de, de, de de, de l'après-Covid qui est piloté par l'organisation, donc le PNUD, le, 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 programme nation, le programme des Nations Unies pour le développement, donc pour pouvoir réfléchir sur toutes les différentes dimensions donc, de, de ce programme-là d'après-Covid, de, de, dans lequel évidemment l'OMS intervient donc, dans le volet santé. On a vu euh, la, avec cette pandémie-là toutes les limites associées donc, à, à nos systèmes de santé pour pouvoir réagir de façon efficace et à temps opportun donc, à ce type donc, de, de de santé publique là. Donc, c'est des enjeux qui devront être adressés. Donc, reconstruire des systèmes de santé qui sont beaucoup plus robustes, qui sont beaucoup plus réactifs, donc qui permettent de détecter le plus rapidement que possible donc, ces différents événements donc, de santé publique là. Mais également, donc, l'engagement d'autres partenaires tels que l'UNICEF, comme je le disais encore, dans le, du côté de l'éducation ou encore même toutes les autres organisations donc, qui s'occupent du monde de la finance et de, de l'économie. Donc, ces processus sont en cours actuellement. Évidemment, comme je l'ai dit, donc, c'est des démarches Uh, extra multisectoriel donc qui, qui, qui prennent uh, beaucoup d'autres partenaires la banque mondiale le FMI et uh, autant au niveau régional qu'au niveau global ici nous nous interagissons sur une base par exemple hebdomadaire avec la commission africaine uh, économique africaine des de, de nations Unies à Addis, donc, pour adresser un peu les conséquences un peu économiques donc, de cette pandémie-là. Donc, ces réflexions sont en cours et cette planification est en cours. Mais d'ores et déjà, je peux aussi tout simplement mentionner pour finir, pendant que l'on a été, donc, pendant ces un an et demi, ou bien ces deux cette pandémie, il faut certainement se dire que des actions ont déjà été prises un peu là pour le renforcement de tous ces différents systèmes de santé là et de nos capacités de réponse. Et donc, c'est une réflexion qui est déjà en cours, dont les, certains gestes sont déjà posés, mais euh, qui continue aussi donc, dans une logique et dans une approche beaucoup plus multisectorielle. Alors, merci à vous. Merci beaucoup, docteur Tiano Baldé. Euh, merci beaucoup, docteur Richard Migo. Nous avons fait le, le tour des, des questions euh, en français. Euh, donc, merci à nos, nos deux experts. Merci aux journalistes francophones qui sont restés avec nous. Et euh, je, je, je vous dis à la semaine prochaine. Merci. Merci. Bonne journée. OK, merci. Au revoir.